Chapter Six of Abbotsford and Newstead Abbey by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Abbotsford, Part Six. There was an old shepherd, he said, in the service of the family, who used to sit under the sunny wall and tell marvellous stories, and recite old-time ballads, as he knitted stockings. Scott used to be wheeled out in his chair, in fine weather, and would sit beside the old man and listen to him for hours. The situation of Sandy No was favourable both for storyteller and listener. It commanded a wide view over the border country, with its feudal towers, its haunted glens and wizard streams. As the old shepherd told his tales, he could point out the very scene of action. Thus, before Scott could walk, he was made familiar with the scenes of his future stories. They were all seen as through a magic medium, and took that tinge of romance which they ever after retained in his imagination. From the height of Sandy No, he may be said to have had the first look out upon the promised land of his future glory. On referring to Scott's works, I find many of the circumstances related in this conversation about the old tower and the boyish scenes connected with it, recorded in the introduction to Marmion, already cited. This was frequently the case with Scott. Incidents and feelings that had appeared in his writings were apt to be mingled up in his conversation, for they had been taken from what he had witnessed and felt in real life, and were connected with those scenes among which he lived, and moved, and had his being. I make no scruple at quoting the passage relative to the tower, though it repeats much of the foregone imagery, and with vastly superior effect. Thus, while I ape the measure wild, of tales that charmed me yet a child, rude though they be, still with the chime, return the thoughts of early time, and feelings roused in life's first day, glow in the line and prompt the delay. Then rise those crags, that mountain tower, which charmed my fancy's wakening hour though no broad river swept along, to claim, perchance, heroic song. Though sighed no groves in summer gale, to prompt of love a softer tale. Though scarce a puny streamlet's speed claimed homage from a shepherd's reed. It was poetic impulse given by the green hill and clear blue heaven. It was a barren scene and wild, where naked cliffs were rudely piled. But ever and anon between lay velvet tufts of loveliest green. And well the lonely infant knew recesses where the wallflower grew, and honeysuckle loved to crawl up the low crag and ruined wall. I deemed such nooks the sweetest shade the sun in all his round surveyed. And still I thought that shattered tower The mightiest work of human power, And marveled as the aged hind With some strange tale bewitched my mind Of Fourier's who, with headlong force, Down from that strength had spurred their horse, Their southern rapine to renew, Far in the distant Cheviot's blue, And home returning filled the hall, with revel, wassail rout, and brawl. Methought that still, with tramp and clang, The gateways broken, arches rang. Methought grim features, seamed with scars, Glared through the windows, rusty bars. And ever by the winter hearth, Old tales I heard of woe or mirth, Of lovers' slights, of ladies' charms, Of witches' spells, of warriors' arms, of patriot battles, one of old, by Wallace Witt and Bruce the Bold, of later fields of feud and fight, when pouring from the highland height, 
the Scottish clans in headlong sway had swept the scarlet ranks away, while stretched at length upon the floor. Again I fought each combat o'er, pebbles and shells in order laid, the mimic ranks of war displayed. And onward still the Scottish lion bore, and still the scattered Southron fled before. Scott eyed the distant height of Sandy No with an enormous gaze as we rode along, and said he had often thought of buying the place, repairing the old tower, and making it his residence. He has in some measure, however, paid off his early debt of gratitude, and clothing it with poetic and romantic associations, by his tale of the eve of st john it is to be hoped that those who actually possess so interesting a monument of scott's early days will preserve it from further dilapidation not far from sandy no scott pointed out another old border hold standing on the summit of a hill which had been a kind of enchanted castle to him in his boyhood it was the tower of bemerside the baronial residence of the Hagues, or de Haggis, one of the oldest families of the border. There had seemed to him, he said, almost a wizard's spell hanging over it, in consequence of a prophecy of Thomas the Rhymer, in which, in his young days, he most potently believed. Betide, betide, whatever betide, Hague shall be Hag of Bemerside scott added some particulars which showed that in the present instance the venerable thomas had not proved the false prophet for it was a noted fact that amid all the changes and chances of the border through all the feuds and forays and sackings and burnings which had reduced most of the castles to ruins and the proud families that once possessed them to poverty the tower of bemerside still remained unscathed, and was still the stronghold of the ancient family of Haig. Prophecies, however, often ensure their own fulfillment. It is very probable that the prediction of Thomas the Rhymer has linked the Hagues to their tower, as their rock of safety, and has induced them to cling to it almost superstitiously, through hardships and inconveniences that would, otherwise, have caused its abandonment. I afterwards saw at Dryber Abbey, the burying place of this predestined and tenacious family, the inscription of which showed the value they set upon their antiquity. Locus sepultura, antiquissima familia de Haga de Bemerside. In reverting to the days of his childhood, Scott observed that the lameness which had disabled him in infancy gradually decreased he soon acquired strength in his limbs and though he always limped he became even in boyhood a great walker he used frequently to stroll from home and wander about the country for days together picking up all kinds of local gossip and observing popular scenes and characters his father used to be vexed with him for this wandering propensity and shaking his head would say he fancied the boy would make nothing but a peddler as he grew older he became a keen sportsman and passed much of his time hunting and shooting his field sports led him into the most wild and unfrequented parts of the country and in this way he picked up much of that local knowledge which he has since evinced in his writings his first visit to loch katrina he says was in his boyish days on a shooting excursion the island which he has made the romantic residence of the lady of the lake was then garrisoned by an old man and his wife their house was vacant they put the key under the door and were absent fishing it was at that time a peaceful residence but became afterward a resort of smugglers until they were ferreted out in after years when Scott began to turn this local knowledge to literary account, he revisited many of those scenes of his early ramblings, and endeavored to secure the fugitive remains of the traditions and songs that had charmed his boyhood. 
when collecting materials for his border minstrelsy he used he said to go from cottage to cottage and make the old wives repeat all they knew if but two lines and by putting these scraps together he retrieved many a fine characteristic old ballad or tradition from oblivion i regret to say that i can scarce recollect anything of our visit to dryburg abbey it is on the estate of the earl of buchan the religious edifice is a mere ruin rich in gothic antiquities but especially interesting to scott from containing the family vault and the tombs and monuments of his ancestors he appeared to feel much chagrin at their being in the possession and subject to the intermeddlings of the earl who was represented as a nobleman of an eccentric character the latter however set great value on these sepulchral relics and it expressed a lively anticipation of one day or other having the honor of burying scott and adding his monument to the collection which he intended should be worthy of the mighty minstrel of the north a prospective compliment which was by no means relished by the object of it one of my pleasant rambles with scott about the neighborhood of abbotsford was taken in company with mr william laidlaw the steward of his estate this was a gentleman for whom scott entertained a particular value he had been born to a competency had been well educated his mind was richly stored with varied information and he was a man of sterling moral worth having been reduced by misfortune scott had got him to take charge of his estate he lived at a small farm on the hillside above abbotsford and was treated by scott as a cherished and confidential friend rather than a dependent as the day was showery scott was attended by one of his retainers named tommy Purdie, who carried his plaid and who deserves especial mention sophia scott used to call him her father's grand vizier and she gave a playful account one evening as she was hanging on her father's arm of the consultations which he and tommy used to have about matters relative to farming Purdy was tenacious of his opinions and he and scott would have long disputes in front of the house as to something that was to be done on the estate until the latter fairly tired out would abandon the ground and the argument exclaiming well well tom have it your own way after a time however Purdy would present himself at the door of the parlor and observe i have been thinking over the matter and upon the whole i think i'll take your honor's advice scott laughed heartily when this anecdote was told of him it was with him and tom he said as it was with an old laird and a pet servant whom he had indulged until he was positive beyond all endurance this won't do cried the old laird in a passion we can't live together any longer we must part and where the dale does your honor mean to go replied the other i would moreover observe of tom Purdy, he was a firm believer in ghosts and warlocks and all kinds of old wives fable he was a religious man too mingling a little degree of scottish pride in his devotion for though his salary was but twenty pounds a year he had managed to afford seven pounds for a family bible it is true he had one hundred pounds clear of the world and was looked up to by his comrades as a man of property in the course of our morning walk we stopped at a small house belonging to one of the laborers on the estate the object of scott's visit was to inspect a relic which had been digged up in a roman camp and which if i recollect right he pronounced to have been a tongs it was produced by the cottager's wife a ruddy healthy-looking dame whom scott addressed by the name of ailey as he stood regarding the relic turning it round and round and making comments upon it half grave half comic with the cottage group around him all joining occasionally in the colloquy the inimitable character of monk barnes was again brought to mind and i seemed to see before me that prince of antiquarians and humorists holding forth to his unlearned and unbelieving neighbors 
whenever scott touched in this way upon local antiquities and in all his familiar conversations about local traditions and superstitions there was always a sly and quiet humour running at the bottom of his discourse and playing about his countenance as if he sported with the subject it seemed to me as if he distrusted his own enthusiasm and was disposed to droll upon his own humours and peculiarities yet at the same time a poetic gleam in his eye would show that he really took a strong relish and interest in them it was a pity he said that antiquarians were generally so dry for the subjects they handled were rich in historical and poetical recollections in picturesque details in quaint and heroic characteristics and in all kinds of curious and obsolete ceremonials they are always groping among the rarest materials for poetry but they have no idea of turning them to poetic use now every fragment from old times has in some degree its story with it or gives an inkling of something characteristic of the circumstances and manners of its day and so sets the imagination at work for my own part i never met with antiquarian so delightful either in his writings or his conversation and the quiet subacid humour that was prone to mingle in his disquisitions gave them to me a peculiar and an exquisite flavour but he seemed in fact to undervalue everything that concerned himself the play of his genius was so easy that he was unconscious of its mighty power and made light of those sports of intellect that shamed the efforts and labours of other minds our ramble this morning took us again up the rhymer's glen and by huntley bank and huntley wood and the silver waterfall overhung with weeping birches and mountain ashes those delicate and beautiful trees which graced the green shaws and burnsides of scotland the heather too a closely woven robe of scottish landscape which covers the nakedness of its hills and mountains tinted the neighbourhood with soft and rich colours as we ascended the glen the prospects opened upon us melrose with its towers and pinnacles lay below beyond were the island hills the cowden nose the tweed the gallow water and all the storied vicinity the whole landscape varied by gleams of sunshine and driving showers scott as usual took the lead limping along with great activity and in joyous mood giving scraps of border rhymes and border stories two or three times in the course of our walk there were drizzling showers which i suppose would put an end to our ramble but my companions trudged on as unconcernedly as if it had been fine weather at length i asked whether we had not better seek some shelter true said scott i did not recollect that you were not accustomed to our scottish mists this is a lacrimose climate ever more showering we however are children of the mist and must not mind a little whimpering of the clouds any more than a man must mind the weeping of an hysterical wife as you were not accustomed to be wet through as a matter of course in a morning's walk we will bide a bit under the lee of this bank till the shower is over taking his seat under shelter of a thicket he called to his man george for his tartan then turning to me come said he come under my plaidy as the old song goes so making me nestle down beside him he wrapped a part of the plaid round me and took me as he said under his wing while we were thus nestled together he pointed to a hole in the opposite bank of the glen that he said was the hole of an old grey badger who was doubtless snugly housed in this bad weather sometimes he saw him at the entrance of his hole like a hermit at the door of his cell telling his beads or reading a homily he had a great respect for the venerable anchorite and would not suffer him to be disturbed he was a kind of successor to thomas the rhymer and perhaps might be thomas himself returned from fairyland but still under fairy spell some accident turned the conversation upon hogg the poet in which laidlaw who was seated beside us took a part 
Hogg had once been a shepherd in the service of his father, and Laidlaw gave many interesting anecdotes of him, of which I now retain no recollection. They used to tend the sheep together when Laidlaw was a boy, and Hogg would recite the first struggling conceptions of his muse. At night, when Laidlaw was quartered comfortably in bed, in the farmhouse, poor Hogg would take to the shepherd's hut in the field on the hillside, and there lie awake for hours together, and look at the stars and make poetry, which he would repeat the next day to his companion. Scott spoke in warm terms of Hogg, and repeated passages from his beautiful poem of Kelmeny, to which he gave great and well-merited praise. He gave also some amusing anecdotes of Hogg and his publisher, Blackwood, who was at that time just rising into the bibliographical importance which he has since enjoyed. Hogg, in one of his poems, I believe the Pilgrims of the Sun, had dabbled a little in metaphysics, and like his heroes, had got into the clouds. Blackwood, who began to affect criticism, argued stoutly with him as to the necessity of omitting or elucidating some obscure passage. Hogg was immovable. But, man, said Blackwood, I dinna ken what ye mean in this passage. Hout tout, man, replied Hogg impatiently. I dinna ken always what I mean mysel. There is many a metaphysical poet in the same predicament with honest Hogg. Scott promised to invite the shepherd to Abbotsford during my visit, and I anticipated much gratification in meeting with him, from the account I had received of his character and manners, and the great pleasure I had derived from his works. Circumstances, however, prevented Scott from performing his promise, and to my great regret, I left Scotland without seeing one of its most original and national characters. When the weather held up, we continued our walk until we came to a beautiful sheet of water in the bosom of the mountain, called, if I recollect right, the Lake of Caldshiel. Scott prided himself much upon this little Mediterranean sea in his dominions, and hoped I was not too much spoiled by our great lakes in America to relish it. He proposed to take me out to the center of it, to a fine point of view, for which purpose we embarked in a small boat, which had been put on the lake by his neighbor, Lord Somerville. As I was about to step on board, I observed in large letters on one of the benches, Search number two. I paused for a moment and repeated the inscription aloud, trying to recollect something I had heard or read to which it alluded. Pshaw! cried Scott. It is only some of Lord Somerville's nonsense. Get in. In an instant, scenes in the antiquary connected with search number one flashed upon my mind. Ah, I remember now, said I, and with a laugh took my seat, but adverted no more to the circumstance. We had a pleasant row about the lake, which commanded some pretty scenery. The most interesting circumstance connected with it, however, according to Scott, was that it was haunted by a bogle in the shape of a water bull, which lived in the deep parts, and now and then came forth upon dry land, and made a tremendous roaring that shook the very hills. This story had been current in the vicinity from time immemorial. There was a man living who declared he had seen the bull, and he was believed by many of his simple neighbors. I don't choose to contradict the tale said Scott, for I am willing to have my lake stocked with any fish, flesh, or fowl that my neighbors think proper to put into it, and these old wives' fables are a kind of property in Scotland that belongs to the estates and goes with the soil. Our streams and lochs are like the rivers and pools in Germany that have all their Wasser nicks or water witches, and I have a fancy for these kind of amphibious bogles and hobgoblins. End of chapter 6 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida